South Texas, the Rio Grande Valley. For humans, it's rugged and harsh. Most everything here sticks or stings, from the mosquito to the mesquite. But for wildlife, it's a predator's paradise, exactly the kind of environment these biologists seek out. Pretty dense in some spots. This looks like good ocelot habitat. Dr. Michael Tuis is a biologist who studies wild cats. It's the elusive ocelot that brings him to the thickets of the coastal brush country. David Schindel is a research assistant. He has the not so enviable task of trying to sedate a not too happy ocelot. When we began the research on ocelots, we weren't even sure if they still occurred in the state. And one reason is the extremely dense habitat that they occupy, people seldom see them. About all most people will ever see of the cat are its footprints. 88 centimeters. Yeah. 13.5 hind foot. Ocelots are rare. There are probably no more than 120 animals in the state of Texas and, and thus in all of the United States. And if we're going to uh, have enough of them to recover to the point where they're no longer on the endangered species list, we have to uh, implement some management strategies. He looks ready. But first, the researchers need to learn as much as they can about these phantom felines. He still can grow a little bit. Okay. Actually, I think we're going to let him sit here for a second yet. Yeah, take another deep breath. Linda Lack studied under Dr. Tuis at Texas A&M Kingsville. She now leads an ocelot research program at Laguna Atascosa, a 46,000-acre refuge managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We put this over his eyes just to, it'll help him relax a little bit if he doesn't see us. And then the next thing I'm going to do, I think, is take a blood sample, because that's one of our most important things to do. OK, now we'll fit the radio collar. It's just right, the collar. The radio collar will let us monitor his movements for up to a mile away. So aside from this one time where we're handling him, we probably won't even see him for the next year. Yeah. We'll just follow his movements. We'll know where he is, but we won't actually see him. Can you see, Tim, that mm -hmm. uh, he's actually got a little piece of his cheek that's missing that was probably from a battle that he was in with another ocelot. They're, These guys are very territorial, aren't they? Yeah, they're territorial, and, and there's so little habitat left that they actually will fight each other for the last few uh, areas of quality habitat that are remaining. He looks like he's in beautiful shape. So now we can uh, put him back in the trap and let him recover. Through the telemetry, you find that ocelots are primarily solitary individuals. Okay. They don't associate with each other much beyond the breeding season. See, I think I'll do it this way. One or two young are born different times during the year, and they remain with the mother for a period of about a year, a year and a half. Beautiful. Ocelots may be scarce in Texas, but in Central and South America, their populations run into the tens of thousands. In the United States, the ocelot is protected by the Endangered Species Act, but in other countries, the cat is still hunted for its unique fur. This coat was confiscated when its owner smuggled it into the United States, not only breaking the law, but violating every conceivable rule of good taste. In Texas, it isn't trappers who are killing the cats. It's the slow, steady destruction of habitat. Like many native species, the ocelot began to disappear as the land was converted to agriculture. 
Also, there was the inevitable conflict of humans versus animals, a battle that humans nearly always won. But no matter how much research is done, how much effort is expended, the ocelots don't have any chance at all, unless they have a place to live. Yes, that would be ocelot habitat. That could easily be. That's a beauty, isn't he a beauty? Oh, yes, yes. Frank Uturia owns one of the largest ranches in Texas. Do you think water covers eyes? Yeah. He's also taken a lead role in ocelot conservation. Owning the ranch land all these years and seeing it as I did as a, as a young boy with wildlife abundant everywhere, you know, you want to keep that for your children and your grandchildren. So there's a, there's a tremendous desire to protect the land, protect the wildlife, to pass it on. You know, when I, when I die, I can't take it with me. It's going to be here. So I want it to be here in such a state that my children and grandchildren can enjoy it just as I did and become attached to it like I have. Mr. Uturia is so serious about protecting the ocelot, he set aside a large tract of land as ocelot habitat. Because it does no good to destroy all the habitat and destroy the wildlife because you can never get them back. Once they're gone, they're gone. Landowners are critical to the recovery of ocelots in Texas. 97% uh, of Texas is owned by private landowners, and most of the ocelots likely occur in private lands. In fact, if it wasn't for them, we probably wouldn't have a viable population of ocelots as we do now. At one time, our state was host to six species of wildcats. Two of them have vanished. The ocelot could be next. It's Texas population down to around 100 cats. And like many other endangered species, the ocelot's destiny may not be of his own making. The danger that we have in this country, I think, about wildlife is that as our population grows, the United States now has, what, 275 million people. What's going to happen when we have 600 million or 800 million? There's no more room for wildlife. As Texas continues to grow and build, the question is, will the ocelot remain a part of our natural heritage, or will the species forever be confined within the walls of our zoos? <laughs>